G'day and welcome to another instalment of the Fly Fishers podcast. Since 1967, we've been spreading the bug of fly fishing at our Melbourne fly shop. Join us as we celebrate the fun of fly fishing and chat with characters that enjoy it as much as we do. Whether you're just starting out or have some experience, we hope our ego-free commentary helps demystify fly fishing and inspires you to visit new places and try new techniques. So today's episode is late season river fishing. We're joined by Philip Weigel. Uh, Phil, welcome back to the podcast, man. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, how's your river season been? It's been really good. Uh, I think the last few years have been exceptionally good. This one's been a little bit different because it's been a season of parts um, from fairly high flows early to surprisingly moderate flows later in spring and then thinking, whoa, might get a bit dry and then we got all that summer rain and everything boof back up again. Yeah. Um, and then the last part, which has been the last month or so, where things have really got pretty stable and low and clear – um, and the whole sort of fishing strategy and so forth has had to change to match that, but it happens to be some of my favourite fishing of the year. Yeah. Do you think this season, as far as the preparation up to that late season, has been pretty typical as far as Australian conditions go, or has it been more on the dry side, would you say, for our northeast rivers? It's been on the dry side, but just the dry side, not exceptionally dry. Right. Yeah. It's um, If you look at the rainfall at Buller and Hotham and those places which feed or are an indicator of the rainfall for a lot of those northeast catchment, there's been pretty good. But it's been a bit of an unusual sort of pattern in the sense that, as I say, December and January were very wet and then it sort of dried off very late in summer. And then there's been bits and pieces since. Um, you could... If there, if there is such a thing as typical, and by the time I get to, you get to my age, you start to wonder if that's even a, a meaningful word. Yeah. Of course, a variability is such a thing with, uh, with everything, but especially fly fishing. Yeah. The, the, um, you'd normally think, you know, really wet, really wet spring. Well, we didn't get that. Uh, we got a moderately wet spring, then, then dry out into sort of late December, January, February, and then, you know, autumn rain coming in moderation um mm. maybe march into april well this year it's not been that pattern yeah so it's been a little bit topsy-turvy but it's still been really good yeah i've yeah. got i've got i've had i've had yeah i've had some magic fishing and i've had some magic fishing in the last week or so so it's still going but you do have to probably think a little bit more about where you go compared to last season okay yeah when 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 water was just not an, not an issue it was yeah. just water everywhere right through yeah uh, but this season in particular, that there's never really been a bad point in the season, has there? It no, seems to have no. Just powered the whole way it's through. It's powered powered through, but you just you have had to in the last last few weeks, you've had to rethink how you fish. Right. Yeah, that's how I describe it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and where you fish. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I mean, you love autumn fishing. I do. Yeah. Uh, why is that? Because it's so visual and it's probably the best uh, time of the year, all things being equal, to have fish up in the middle of the day, rising and obviously therefore being target a target for dry flies. In terms of um, level of difficulty, it's probably a bit higher because the, the lower flows, clear water um, and... The, the fact that the fish tend to be sipping like that in the quieter water means the opportunity to sort of get a good presentation is 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 uh, is tougher. But compared to, say, throwing a royal wolf and a nymph up into a tumbling run, which is what we've been able to get away with for the vast majority of the last three years. So that still happens, but only in places. But the fishing I love is that sipper fishing, as I call it. Right. Yeah, where so, they're up. So what is that? So it's... When the fish are up on the surface pretty consistently from about late morning till sometimes right through till dark and and they're literally just sipping very small insects as a rule off the surface. So they're gentle risers, they're not easy to see um, and it's one of those things where you often just have to stop and stare because they're not going flat out, you know. They, they'll have a little, like just about any hatch you care to name, There'll be there are pulses 
Uh, maybe it's a little puffs of wind blowing stuff off trees. Maybe it's light. Maybe whatever it is. And I'll, if you stare and you stare, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden there's just these little tiny sips. And the size of the sip, as always, is no indication of the size of the fish. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it hard to see those sipping It trout? is, yeah. it is. So you've got to, you've got to just stop and stare. Yeah, so they um, is it just they're sort of sucking the fly? Yeah, down they're or? eating they're eating little food, so it seems to be regardless of what they what it actually is, it's almost always really small. So yep. sometimes it can be small terrestrial stuff, sometimes it can be small um, aquatic insects like mayfly and midge and um, caddis. Um, but the the common theme is it's little and obviously very easy for them to eat. You know, you don't see many slashy rises, you don't see big glomps. You just literally, yeah, sippers. They just sip yeah. them off the top, right. and um, so that extra uh, challenge. And I that, love it. Yeah, yeah, and it's always really rewarding when you catch one. And look, you know, obviously, like as always, some days they're easier than others. Some fish are easier than others. Yeah, um, but it's mesmerising. You yeah. know, it's uh, it's it's pretty much the archetypical fly fishing experience of of sighting. In broad daylight, sight fishing with dry flies to what are often really good fish. Yeah, you know, there's no no limitation on on what might what those fish might be. Mm. Um, you know, they could be they could easily be to even three pounds. Yeah, wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. So they they're often the better fish. Yeah, yeah. Probably probably a bit skewed towards the better fish. In fact. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's time for a short break to talk about the legends who bring this podcast to life. Our committed team at The Fly Fisher prepare, record and edit in-house in South Melbourne. We put huge effort in for you listeners. We hope that means when it comes time to make a fly fishing purchase, you consider us. With your loyalty, we can keep producing these podcasts and bringing you the world's best fly fishing gear. So shop smart and support the fly shop that supports you. So let's, you know, just dial it back to talking autumn fishing and, uh, you know, fairly typical, the water does tend to drop a little bit. You might say it's almost overly settled conditions in gin clear water. Yep. Um, how do we deal with that? You just have to be more careful. Um, so things that you would have got away with three months ago, you're probably not going to get away with now. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a few things you can do to, to make a difference. One is a really basic one is a long leader. Right. Um, because long leaders don't like to land heavily. So I'm talking here 12, 14 feet, even perhaps a bit more. Um, and also they have a tendency not to lay out straight. And that's a good thing because that gives you a bit of automatic um, slack so that the fly drifts as naturally as possible. Right. Okay. And it's interesting, Andrew, if you look, if you watch these sipping fish, sometimes they'll be in a backwater, sometimes they'll be in a bubble line. The currents that they're in will move. Yeah. So it's it's really interesting to stop and watch for a minute and just watch how these currents pulse. And I was fishing to a fish with JD the other day and it was almost like waiting for the perfect wave because yep. if you cast at the wrong moment, the currents were wrong. So even though the fish kept rising, it was almost impossible to get a good drift because of the way – from where your, our position to where the fish was rising was kind of dragging the fly, yep. no matter how carefully you mended and you know, how, how careful your cast was. But if you waited, and we this, this took minutes to notice, there were like these moments when the current got really even and steady. Right. And so if you landed your fly at that moment, um, you got the right drift. Okay. And after about only 20 tries <laughs> eventually fly and uh three pound rainbow are in the same place at the same wow. time yeah so yeah. it was more a timing thing than it was correct. An accuracy thing. correct and that's that often the case and 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 just on that you know don't be too quick to blame your fly yeah because often you think you've done the perfect cast but in the time it's taken for your fly to land on the water that current's just moved over a bit and the fish with it right the fish just follow that current yeah, you know they're underneath it. They 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 know that if they stay under the bubbles, um, that's where the food will be. Okay. So yeah. it's not a genuine refusal. It's just that since your fly landed, the sweet spot has moved. 
Right. So because the fish is so high in the water column, does that make their window quite narrow? It does. And not only that, you know, their focal length would be really short because they're they're trying to pick up tiny food. So they can't really go broad scan when they're trying to eat little aphids and tiny duns and maybe, you know, flying ants, that sort of stuff. They can't go broad, you know, like they could if they were fishing on feeding on hoppers or Kosciuszko duns. Yeah. You know, they're just really having to get that mouth eye coordination thing happening yeah so they're they're just picking them off you know and yeah. they're really that side that side they're just not going to see it it's yeah. not that they're refusing it they're just not seeing it yeah do you think that's a, a is that an observation you've had uh, quite regularly particularly guiding clients you think the trout has refused it but in actual fact the fish hasn't seen your fly that's right so there's it, it, there's a there's a there's basically three ways in which a fish cannot eat a fly one is a conscious refusal. One is a what I'd call an ignorance, yep. where it doesn't even contemplate your fly as food. And one is just bad timing. You know, you've put your done out there on a, on a lake and the fish has just happened to see a real one at the same moment and, and has eaten that one instead. He's been distracted by it. Correct. Him. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think that that's... Uh, you know, it's 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 really important with sippers, especially, to recognise that at the very least, the fish has to see the fly, and it has to be drifting the same as the real food. Right, and that can take a few few goes. Fortunately, if you stay low, if you stay back, if you use a long leader and a long tippet, and a small inoffensive, for want of a better word, fly, you do often get quite a few shots. Okay. Yeah, so that's the good news. Yeah, um, it's not not that you can't stuff them up. Of course you can. You know, if you land the fly line anywhere near them, they're going to be gone. Yeah, I guess the other good news, which you've kind of indicated there, is the fly pattern doesn't seem to matter too much. Apart not too from much. Being yep. Yep. of a small, subtle kind yeah. of nature. Yeah. So if you're looking for a starting point, a little a little spinner pattern seems to be good. When I say little, I'm talking probably a size 16, maybe 18. A little F fly, yep. one of the most basic flies known to man. <laughs> it's a remarkably effective fly for these fish. A little ant pattern. Yeah, I think occasionally, yes, they probably are being selective and they're real bastards. Mind you, if you throw something at them long enough, sometimes they'll still eat it, you know. Yeah. But more often than not, they're being a little bit general in what they're eating, but the common thread is that it's little. So you can't cover them with a royal wolf or a great big, you know, shaving brush because it's just not on their agenda. Yeah. Now, you mentioned aphids there before. Yeah. Uh, Tell us a bit about (laughs) that. Well, I can't tell you too much except a couple of my mates tell me that that's what some of these absolute bastard fish are eating. At this time of year, they're feeding on the willow leaves and things and falling into the water and they're tiny, like they're, they're, they're... uh, match head size. Yeah. It, so it, it looks like they're the kind of thing people mistake for willow grubs quite often. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 So, so the willow grubs. kind of green colour. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're little. They're yeah. tiny and they're round. You right. know, they're like a little um, a little beetle. Yep. Yeah. Tiny little beetle. But, um, you know, it, it's it's be a pyrrhic victory to realise that they're on aphids because you wouldn't have a fly in your box small enough to imitate an aphid. Yeah. So my approach, and maybe, you know, there, there may well be anglers out there with a better approach than me, but my approach is just still to persist with those little F flies, little spinners, things that I think the fish will be seeing often enough that maybe if I drifted over the fish uh, enough times, it will eat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, my, so. my one experience with an aphid feeder, I found a fluorescent green caddis pupa pattern in my box that I was able to gink up and get to sit just in the film. Yep. And that was deadly effective. Fantastic. Um, well, there you but go. But the aphids see, we came across learn. that day were actually quite large. I yeah. reckon they were almost probably 8 to 10 mil long. Oh, well, that's, so that, that's good. Yeah. But, you know, that may still work. Sometimes, who knows what goes through their tiny brains. I mean, sometimes yeah. maybe colour is enough, even if the size is wrong. Yeah, you know? maybe. Especially so, in the fluorescent yeah, sort yeah. of But colours. a really important point on colour, um, you've got to be able to see your fly. Yeah. Because often these fish rise quite regularly and if you can't see your fly, you can't be sure it was it was or wasn't your fly being eaten. Right. And um, a little olive F fly that I was using most recently, it is remarkably visible for a tiny fly. Um, and I definitely reckon the last time I used it, I caught several of my fish 
primarily because I could see the fly. Not only could I track how well it was drifting, so I knew when I wasn't right, I actually knew rise, rise, that was me, you know. And I would have struck on the first or second rise if I hadn't had a fly I could see, thinking that would have been me just judging on where I expected the fly to be without being able to see it. Yeah. So, yeah. Often overlooked with flies, isn't it? But that being able to see it, yeah. th- that's what makes it an effective fly. Correct. In a way. Exactly. And, and sometimes it's more important than other times. Like the fish is rising every 30 seconds and there's a rise where you think your fly was. Well, it probably was you. But if they're rising, you know, six times in a row, bang, 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 and you can't see your fly, you're really just having to toss a coin. Mm. And probably unsuccessfully. Yeah. Mm. Now, you're big on fishing as heavy tippet as you yeah. can get away with. Yes, I am. So what, what tippet diameter are you fishing with a size 16? Look, I'm, I'm trying to get away with, with 4X. Um, there was one fish I was fishing to recently, and I thought, if I hook this, if I'm on 5X, I'm not going to be able to keep it out of the logs, right? So I thought I'd rather not hook it than... Um, hook it and bust off. Yeah. So I thought, damn it, I'll try the, try the 4X, even though it was probably a little heavy for this sort of size 16, maybe even 18 little F fly I was using, but the fish did eat it. So, you know, it was, uh, it was good. And, I, <laughs> and my mate said, thank God you're on the 4X. Yeah. Because this fish was absolutely m- crazy and it, was, it just was doing its darndest to burrow into the logs. Yeah. And I was just giving it to it and I still thought it was going to break the line, but somehow I didn't. Uh, yeah. cooler water temperatures do, do the fish fight that bit harder do you think at this uh, time of year? look yeah possibly but i think they i think they just look in that sort of situation they're going to like on a really warm in really warm water that we might have had in the middle of summer yes they wouldn't fight as hard but yeah probably ever since you know march they've the water's been cool enough for them to fight hard and it's probably just the circumstances right um I remember that uh, Peter Morse once told me, and I thought this was very interesting. We were talking about permit. I was very proud of having caught a permit. We sort of sound like we're sidetracking, but we're not. Um, and he and I said, "Man, they fight hard, don't they, Peter?" And he said, "Oh, they do." But he said, "I think they fight. They seem to fight a lot harder than they actually do because people are so terrified of losing them." <laughs> and I thought that was a great point. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you really, if you really care whether yeah. you're going to land it or not, it probably makes the fish appear to fight a lot harder. It's yeah. probably a lot more stressful. Sure. Um, and I think, yeah, when you when you're hooking a fish in close contact to logs and twigs and you know things that you might get broken off on, yeah. it probably seems to fight a lot more powerfully than it really does. So but, much that can go wrong. So, so much that can go wrong. But on top of that, too, you know, they're in they're in really good condition because they've had such a good yeah so yeah that prop that part probably is real mm. you know this this uh big rainbow i keep talking about it was a football mm. you know it looked like it came out of a lake mm. and on, on rip- the goulburn was it yeah on the goulburn that yeah. one yeah, yeah yeah um and i got a couple in the jamison in the um jamison and the upper goulburn mm. that were perhaps not quite as as uh fat but still really really thick set you know for a for a, a natural river fish yeah good and they just fight hard yeah so they had they've had a good year by and large i think yeah yeah uh you touched on a little bit but where where would the trout sit in the rivers at, at this time of year i guess they're looking so one of the things that i suspect about cold water is that um it's weird you know sometimes they'll actually not be in those really fast runs that we expect them to be in. And it's almost like they're too lazy in that colder water, less energetic, or maybe that's a food thing. Maybe they can see the food more easily in the quieter water. Um, so, yeah, water that I've walked straight past for a lot of the year, like those slow, it's got to be flowing because they're still drift feeding. They still need a current to be bringing food towards them. But that sort of medi- slow to medium pace uh, runs and pulls – with a dis- if at all possible, is a distinct bubble line coming down so that you've got a, a focal point to, to stare at to see if you can see a fish. And also backwaters. They love the backwaters. Is you that know? because the food's there? or just- Yeah, yeah. I think it's where it's, they can easily get to the, get the food without yep. much work. So it's low energy feeding this, you mm. know. The, 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 the energy profit would be high because they're not fighting very much current at all. Not that they're not good at fighting current anyway, but in that slow water, they can just, you know, they've really got the little sort of sushi train coming down and they just, you know, <laughs> yeah. nip, 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 
yeah. and barely expend a kilojoule doing yeah. so. What about uh, cover and shelter? Are they qualified? They would rather have it, but they will do without it if the food reward's there. Right. Yeah, it's surprising fish that you wouldn't see for a lot of the year, for whatever reason, seem prepared to be a little bit more bold, which is some sort of offset towards that clear, um, you know, painful, painfully um, low still water that they will move out. Um, yeah, a good fish that I got in the Jamison lately, I, I, I really didn't think I'd catch it because I thought, you know what, I'm just going to line this fish. Mm. It was in such an exposed spot. It granted a bit of shade, but it was still out in the middle, metre of water, gentle current. Mm. I thought, I'm just not going to be able to land the fly without spooking this fish, but hey, he, he ate it. So yeah. that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, and that happened with a, with a few others. Can I say... <laughs> <laughs> over the course of the last few weeks, there's been plenty that haven't eaten it as well, right? So, yeah, yeah sometimes they, they are just just about impossible or at least impossible to, to me. And that's part of the appeal of fishing. It is, time, it is. But when you get one, it's bloody great. Oh, yeah. It really is very, very cool. Yeah. 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 Good. Now, we, a, we've, I feel like we went down a bit of a rabbit hole talking about uh, sippers and dry fly fishing. Yes. Uh, maybe tell us a bit more about the nymph fishing and what we can Def, expect. Definitely worth doing. Um so I think as always, um, or not as always, that's a sweeping generalisation, but I think finding those nice little holding drop-offs, bits of structure in, in the fast water and really just working a nymph through down deep is well worth doing. But it has to be down deep. Usually, often it does. This time of year it really does. Like if, you, if you're a foot off the bottom, you're not going to succeed. Right. So I still enjoy fishing an indicator rather than your own nymphing, but it's probably your own nymphing paradise. Sure. Um, yeah, and just look for the little lips and drops and you know bits of water where the fish got a little bit more cover in that fast water, and man, there's some good fish in there. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't have to be deep, but just try to pick out the spots that are just that little bit different. Yeah. 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 Uh, and especially so on the Goulburn, would you say? Oh yes, especially so on the Golden, but anywhere, right? Any river, yep. yeah. That's got got a, got some faster water in between the the slow bits. Um, you know, if there was ever an argument for two rods, or at least a mate <laughs> fishing one way and you fishing another, this would be it because it's a totally different setup for the sipper fishing mm. than for the nymph for the nymph fishing. So, and the the nymph patterns, what uh, what do you? What's an observation with those? Does small, it, small and heavy. Yeah, I think yep. I don't think big and heavy's working very well for me. Yeah, but small and heavy is. Um, and then there's the issue of how how obvious do you want your fly to be? Um, you know, pulling power versus eating power. Um, the 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 perennial dilemma. Um, I think I probably feel like you can be reasonably natural and get away with it. So uh, a, a good fly for me lately has been a little caddis grub, yep. just, a, just a plain, it's, in, it's on ineffective flies. I think, what does Craig call it? The tie in a caddis, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah just a basic, really basic caddis grub. Yep. Um, and that must might be com- confidence as much as, as anything. And maybe a, maybe a pheasant tail... Yeah, with a little bit of a hot dot on it, just something to catch their attention. Yeah, um, do you think the bead colour matters much? That's a very good question. I don't honestly know. I've grappled with bead colour <laughs> forever. Yeah, um, and it's just so hard to nail. Like the comp fishers um, have these theories about silver in one kind of water and gold in another kind of water and bronze in another kind of water. I, I honestly don't know. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like dry flies and nymphs maybe downsizing the fly. Yeah, I think. I, a little yeah, bit. I think so. I, I I think it's really important. Like I say, that that nymph gets down. I mean, the water's clear everywhere, so in theory, at least, the fish shouldn't have any trouble finding the fly. Yeah. So in in October or November, you may want a big, fairly bright nymph, just so that the fish can find it in that slightly discoloured water. Now that's not an issue anymore. Mm. Um, or not right at the moment anyway, and for the next week or so by the looks that of it. That makes sense, yeah. 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 Yeah, so I think something that they're prepared to eat that can get down is the key with the nymph. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and places to go, small streams or tail races? What, oh, well, uh, tail, the, like, like as, you, as, as the, the, obviously the, the, the golden's been, been good forever. Um, 
we're really reaping the benefits of those higher winter flows, which a lot of anglers probably weren't even aware of, but it's there on fly stream that a few years ago, um, a case was made to keep the minimum flow of the Goulburn over winter a bit higher. And as is often observed world over, the carrying capacity of a river is really determined by its lowest when, it's water its, when it's at its worst, right? right? Not at, and not at its best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So if you go to a New Zealand river in, in spring and think, gosh, there doesn't seem to be many fish in here, well, if you saw it in February, you'd understand why. Right. Now, fish will move in and out of rivers, sure, but at the end of the day, the carrying capacity, including the food supply, is determined by what the low flow uh, state of that stream is. So having a low flow of 400 megalitres a day versus the old 160 megalitres a day, mm. I think has been a real boon for that river. Yeah. Um, and... You know that the 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 fish, the fish population and the quality of the fish is is very very good. I mean, we're really lucky to have it. Yeah. It yes, it can be a frustratingly technical river for me as well, um, and it can be a river where you know you think where the bloody hell are they? Um, but they they're there. Mm. You know, and mm. and that's uh, that's a really encouraging thing. So yes, the Goldman itself and the the the, the rivers that are um, probably closer to the southern ends of the catchments because those parts have had like the big the big river marysville big river not the not the um anglers rest big river um rubicon uh any of those rivers on that sort of southern side of the eildon catchment Mm. and probably as you work your way uh north they're getting skinnier and skinnier because they haven't quite caught that rain that's come up from the south in the last little while. Yeah. Um, and, of course, the Mitter, mitter Tailwater. Mm-hmm. Um, the Upper Mitter, too, would be well worth a go, although as, as every day goes by at this time of year, it's getting progressively colder and colder up there. And to me, the sort of fishing that I really enjoy will eventually be killed by the cold on all the rivers. So if you can find some that are not um, as elevated as – shaded um you'll get a longer end of tail end of the season yeah yeah uh the yeah obviously the fishing you enjoy is is more what we're describing yeah, here yeah. but there is that point where the fish uh i guess switch over to spawning mode yeah um the some of these smaller streams is it true that some of the the, the better fish move into the smaller streams quite a bit before it actually comes time to it can spawn? they can do yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely and and similarly you know you'll find I, I guess for whatever reason, as it gets, maybe it's a maybe it's a stocking up for winter sort of thing. But you'll su- find bigger fish out in daylight in more obvious spots in many rivers, um, as a function of the the late autumn fishing. So whether that's a pre spawn thing, whether it's a feed up for winter thing, um, and you will, yes, yeah, some fish will begin to move up the small streams. Um, how much water's in those streams is probably a big factor in that. Right. Um, and how sort of keen they are to feed. So, yeah, at the moment, yeah, there'll be there'll be good fish present in any water that can hold them. Trout uh, move around a lot. They do, they do, and 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 as a species, within one sort of cohort, there'll be the there'll be the the migrators and the stay at homes. Right. Yeah, okay. which is a, which is a real sort of evolutionary survival thing, right? Yeah. So you want some of the cohort to go out into the big wide world and 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 make a home for themselves elsewhere, because if a catastrophe hits home water, um, they're all the eggs aren't in one basket, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. But on but on the other hand, it makes sense for some of the fish to be stay at home. So okay. you, studies show that some fish, some trout will spawn in their in the run at the head of their home pool. You know, yeah, yeah. they're not and going uh, anywhere. They're just uh, <laughs> and others all others all swim out to sea and go two hundred meter kilometers along the coastline and swim up another river. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's uh, it's absolutely extraordinary how variable they are, and yeah. uh, it's probably stood them in good stead over the years because well adapted. It just spread, spreads the spreads the risk. Mm. Yeah, mm. by not having them all stay at home. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when autumn rolls around, what rivers are you kind of, what, what's on your radar typically? Look, all, always the tailwaters, right? Yeah. Assuming the flows are at a good level, which they pretty much are at the moment. So the Kiwi, the Mitter, 
Swampy. The, yeah, the Swampy, uh, the Murray proper, especially. Right. You know, definitely the Murray proper. Yep. Um, much better access and almost as good a fishing. Some of the best super fishing I've ever had has been on the uh, on the Murray at Tawong and um, Bring and Brong and those sort of places, you know. Yep. Uh, classic so assuming snow hydro don't get too carried away with how much water they're chucking down because this whole sip of thing is killed by high flows right yeah yeah not that you can't catch fish but the sip of thing is is a function of gentle flows so if the golden were at you know five thousand megalitres a day instead of the current sort of two and a half thousand megalitres a day it'd be a whole different story yes you could probably find them but the places you'd find them would be limited because a good a good way of thinking of it is if you if you go to a really big pool and, and it's what I would call creased, so you can see the sort of you know, the water doing little swirly things. Yep. I think, mm, I don't think this is gonna work. Yeah. You okay. know? I want that nice flat sort of surface. Yeah. As an indicator of the flow being about right. Okay. Yeah. So I good think, tip. yeah, I think that's uh, that's what you're looking for, and you're often going to get it at the moment. Yeah, uh, on those on those tailwaters, the Kiwa, the Midder, the um, the Goulburn, of course, um, and uh, and yeah, up on the border, the Upper Murray, especially because it's got more of that sort of languid sort of uh, water than the the swampy. Now, I mean, I mean, you'll catch them in the swampy. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know you can your your access and everything is so much better down on the Murray proper. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I guess the small streams though, if you were uh, to fish the small streams over the tail races at yep. this time yep. of year, yep. um, any uh, any rivers that really stand out, or any techniques you think in the smaller water that might um, be worthwhile knowing. I guess the same sort of thing is whilst the flows are low, just just stay back and 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 so look you'll, look you'll still carefully. Get don't the sippers in. Yeah, the or even streams. just fish fish on nymphs and yep. dries, but just don't <laughs> blunder onto them. Right. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think is I, I I've I've come across this all my life um, is anglers believe because they're not seeing fish that the fish aren't there, as if they've got these amazing sort of infrared. Eyes, you know, <laughs> they may, so they may have uh, Smith Optics low light. Yeah, yeah, artists. yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, it's and, not X-ray and, and, and you know, it, 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 I'm still amazed by how I can be fishing a river um, that's very, very low and very, very painfully clear in the middle of the day, and thinking I can see everything. Mm. You know, even if even even spooking fish, and then. No, there's nothing here, and then go back there on a on a mild evening when there's a hatch, and suddenly there's fish, half a dozen fish rising in that same bit of water where you couldn't see one to save yourself. Wow. Yeah. yeah so um, I think the lesson in that is, you know, you've really got to stare bloody hard and fish from well back before you sort of blunder onto a bit of water, and then think, oh yeah, there's nothing there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um. And. Do you find the rainbows and the browns in different sorts of water, or are they uh, the sippers? They tend to be basically the same at the moment. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. No. I, I, I'm I'm struggling to differentiate. Like the usual rule, when it's really uh, when the flows are really big, are the rainbows are more inclined to be in that very very fast water. Although it's still only a loose rule. It's mm. not a hard and fast rule. Yeah. Oh, and and look for the. I should jump in and say, uh, the evening rises are hanging in there. Yeah. Yep. Now, for how much longer I don't know, but it is worth trying to be on the water on dark at the moment. Whilst we have this somewhat milder weather, you could get fifteen minutes of Kosciuszko Duns um, right on dark. Yeah. yeah, and that's very good fun. Probably yeah. the best part of the day, and yeah, a nice well, way to uh, finish it. Well, 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 it's it's certainly the uh, it's certainly nice to put on a size. Tw- 10 fly or a size 12 fly and, you know... Some, 3X, some, it. Some 3X, <laughs> if not 2X. <laughs> and, uh, and have a nice blast away in, the, in that fast water for those, for those fish slashing, you know, instead, yeah. of, instead of sipping. Yeah. Um, but that's probably a day-to-day proposition. But I, if it were me, I'd still be hanging around waiting for that on natural streams and on the tail waters. Okay. Yeah, for those, la- those last-minute done-slash-caddis hatches. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Won't be home for dinner. Won't be home for dinner. <laughs> yeah. It's not dark until you can see stars in the sky, mum. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the Browns, they spawn first. Rainbows. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They do. There's, a, there's considerable overlap. Yep. Um, but yes, yes. As a rule, the Browns, the Browns spawn sooner. But once again, risk spreading, environmental factors like um, like rain and cold and flow will have an impact on when they spawn, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, once you've got fish that are gen- – Browns especially, once they're genuinely spawning, it's lockjaw. You know, they're really they they they're almost going to self preserve by their reluctance to eat a fly. Mm. Um, so, sort of be careful what you wish for there. But mm. pre spawning, different story. Yeah, almost the opposite. You right. know, compensating for that period when they're going to be eating very little and they're totally focused on making babies. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, do you ever fish the spawn run? No, no. Have you ever? Uh, oh, as as a young guy, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but for for me personally, if 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 it's if it's legal and you obey the rules, you know, I've got no problem with it. But yeah. for me, I kind of just lost interest in it. Yeah, um, and I especially lost interest in some of the bad behaviour I saw in in New South Wales, especially on the Spawn Run rivers. Yeah, just lack of courtesy and and you know, I hear people say, "Oh, I, 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 how how was it up there on the Yukonbeen River? Oh, it was terrible." I said I was sitting on a pool waiting for a fish to move and this guy walked straight past me and threw his lure through it. Yeah. Sometimes even a fly. Yeah. And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's the deal. If you're not prepared to cop that, mm. don't do that kind of fishing. Yeah. Yeah. Because really that combat, as, as they'd call in the US, combat fishing um, <laughs> is not, you know, isn't for everybody. That's if not. You're prepared to, if you're prepared to uh, put up with that sort of invasion of personal space, bad behaviour, Ignorant behaviour, because let's face it, some people will just be doing the wrong thing because they don't know any better. Yeah. Um, so is it worth pointing out that catching trout at that point in time is a you, – you're getting them at their most vulnerable state throughout the year? <clears throat> well, I guess what you are getting in that situation, and again, it, like, like the you can be in the Threadbow Rivers are examples on the steroids because you've got very, very productive lakes fed by comparatively small rivers. So there's a super concentration of super big fish, which is why, you know, they're so famous. Mm. Uh, the Tongariro does the same sort of thing in New Zealand. Mm. Um, and Al- almost year-round over there. Almost year-round, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. If you get enough fish, the spawning season can be very, very long. Mm. Um, and... The, so it's not by virtue of their, their, their ver- how voracious they are that they're vulnerable. It's more by virtue of their, the sheer number of fish that are way bigger than most people encounter on a stream in a typical year. Yeah. So that's, we don't have that so much in Victoria, mm. um, but that's not to say you wouldn't find some pretty big spawners out in the open uh, where you wouldn't normally expect to see those sort of fish. Sure. But I like finding them when they're sipping. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because then they're, you know, they're, they're actually, you know, uh, for want of a better word, a uh, uh, an aesthetically pleasing target. <laughs> they're, they're feeding fish that you have to convince to eat your fly. Yes, but they're yeah. still often bigger than what you would see two months ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think there is something going on there with maybe the lower light in the sky, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, maybe that sense of urgency, the water's getting colder, winter's coming now's my chance to put on a bit of food before I, you know, go off and spawn. Whatever it is, I don't honestly know. Yeah. But they're you, active. They're, yeah, you see, you see a lot more big fish more often on all the streams, not mm. just the tailwaters. Mm. Um, and they're, they're, do the right thing with your, with, your, with your technique and they're catchable, yeah. you know. Right. So you can yeah. kind of have the best of both worlds. Uh, I, I don't think this is something you do a lot of, but big streamers, do they work quite well at, in autumn? Oh, they, they no doubt would. Yeah. Um, I, and, yeah, it's a, it's a good idea. It's yeah. a good idea. And I don't, don't get me wrong, I have no problem with it, right? Mm. And at certain times, I'll fish a big streamer. Yeah. And not just in autumn. Like, I'll fish it at, at other times because it can sometimes save your day. Yeah, and I don't really always understand why it makes a lot more sense in autumn when they're getting aggressive and more probably more territorial and um, uh, more what's the word for it probably feeling a little bit safer with the lower light even though it may not seem like lower light to us it has to be because you know you, you're not going to get sunburned in April the same as you do in January yeah um, so there there there's probably 
there, there would definitely be opportunities for that. Um, one thing I think about streamer fishing is you kind of, it's do or die. Like mm. once you've dragged that big wet through a pool a few times and haven't caught something, that's probably that gone. Yeah. yeah, but with the sippers, you can literally have hours of fishing on one decent bit of water. I wonder if that's why the guys that are fishing those big streamers are typically drifting. Yeah, and probably and, and moving around a lot. And yeah. look, don't get me wrong, like I say, it's a really legitimate way to fish and if you're and catching it's fun good, and it, visual too. Yeah, visual. Especially out of the boat. Yeah, yeah. In a drift boat it'd be mm. great. And you can do it on foot. A couple of my mates do it a lot more than me yeah. and um and they do well, you know. And that'll and and like I say, I can think of a couple of occasions over the last few years, not necessarily this time of year, where incredibly dead fishing has been turned around by me walking back down the river pulling a big magoo yeah um it's just bizarre mm. it, again proof that because you can't see the fish doesn't mean they're not there <laughs> you know i'm sort of thinking where have all the fish gone yeah. you know and then i get the streamer out and sort of fish my way back just out of curiosity and catch three or four fish so mm. yeah it's a it's a it's a good option but for whatever reason you know I'm just addicted to that little dry fly stuff. Oh, you know? fair that, enough. Yeah, and yeah. I and, and it's really nice getting them on the nymph too. Don't get me wrong, but that's that's my if my mates say, look, who wants to do the sippers? Who wants to fish the nymph? Um, I'll fish to the sippers because <laughs> I just it's just a it only lasts for a, for a few weeks, maybe a month. Yeah, at its very best, yeah. and uh, yeah, I want to make the most of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've kind of done the wrong thing, I guess. We're we're you know recording this podcast. What is it? The uh, the second of may third of may whatever yeah. it is um so we're kind of getting to, towards the end of it now, we are it? it's yep. going to hang in there while this big high is over us though right yeah so um look don't start too early got to give it time to warm up you're just going to um be going when you should be coming if you if if you if you start too early yeah um that that little you need that fog to go fog's the enemy you just don't want that so the fog might take until nearly midday to burn away um but whilst this settled weather's with us, mm. they should keep going. Touch wood. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So starting a little bit late, you think that warmth, uh, that sun hitting yeah, the water, yeah. uh, the brighter days? Or yeah, just- bright, bright's fine. Doesn't need to be cloudy. Cloudy's fine too. Yep. The main, you just don't want much wind. Wind doesn't seem to be good because it just me- messes up that surface. Um, I mean, you can still find little corners and things where it's still doable. But I would rather not have too much wind. Um, so settled is the sort of, in every respect, the flows, the weather, settled is what you want. But being May, you need to give it time to, mm. to warm up. So have you got your finger on the pulse with uh, current flow rates for these tail races before you do Yeah, it, definitely. Do def- definitely. I'd always yeah. look. I'd always look. And what um, are you looking at in flows? Oh, look, I would probably rather... Three and a half thousand or less on the Goulburn. Yep. Um, and really, there's no bottom limit. But of course, as it gets as it gets really low, uh, as it drops down towards that four hundred, um, some water's just going to be too still mm. on the really big pools. It's just going to be too flowless. Yeah. Some of that stuff up towards uh, Snobs Creek, you know, where you've just got those super big long still pools. Mm. It's not that there won't be fish rising, but they'll be very, very difficult to track because they won't be drift feeding. They'll be just wandering. Yeah. And stability um, in flow, is that a... That's good, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So if yeah. you've seen a, a spike or a drop in flow or it's happening the day that you're there... Yeah, you, I'd you rather might... it wasn't coming up. I wouldn't mind if it was dropping a bit, but I'd yeah. rather it wasn't coming up. If it was coming up, that might be better for nymphing. Yeah. But not so good for the sippers. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I would have so, almost thought it to be the opposite, you know, like dropping water... I would have thought might be something that makes a fish go a bit weird, but I don't know why I'm thinking that. Oh, it's le- it's a legitimate thought, and it's the, as as I keep saying the, the 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 longer I do this, the less of a reliable witness I am for any rules, <laughs> right? Because you just keep seeing the rules get broken. But yeah, a gentle drop for it's sippers okay. is within yeah. reason is yeah. good. Yeah, if it drops from low to super low, maybe not. But if it's just dropping from moderate to a bit lower. Yeah, great. Yeah, Good. yeah, just more of that smooth water we think we're, we're we're looking for. Yeah, yeah, rather than the creased, messy stuff. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's good. Um, anything else you'd like to add as far as uh, technique or things that people need to keep an eye out for during I just, autumn fishing? I just think you know, just tread quietly, move move slowly, Stealth. look look look. 
Yeah. Don't just blast your way up or yeah. you'll be, you know, spooking fish without knowing you've even done it. And keeping a low profile. Keeping a low profile. The usual stuff about dull clothes. But, you know, crossing, just be careful of your bow waves, you know, because yeah. they're going to go further up the pool than they would have a few months ago. Good and that's never a good thing. I mean... Again, you know, sometimes fish will tolerate that, sometimes they won't. But you might as well put as many odds in your favour as you can. Mm. So, yeah, move move slowly, carefully. Keep the keep the wading. Don't wade if you don't have to. And if you do wade, just wade really slowly. Don't lift your feet too much, you know. Mm. Don't sort of walk like you normally would. Lift your feet a little, but slide them rather than sort of clomp, clomp, clomp. Yeah. Um, and if you do put a bit of a wave up the river and it's unavoidable, just stop for a minute, and just let it subside, and then mm. wait again. And yeah, and and I can't stress looking looking hard. Yeah, you know you're not going to see these fish if you don't look hard. And Andrew, there'll be places where they should be and they're not, and there'll be places where you think, ah, oh, I don't think there'll be one here, but I have a quick look, and damn, there's two. Mm. You know, two beauties going for it. So. Mm. It's uh, it's not a neat formula, but yeah, look hard in all the possible places where that food might be a bit concentrated, but it's flat enough that the fish are going to be able to have a leisurely feed. Yeah, yeah. The thing I find fishing in autumn as well, which always catches me out, is the the middle of the day is hot. it's hot. Like when you're fishing, quite often you yeah, get, the sun, you get the, warm. The you solar know? radiation can heat you up surprisingly. Yeah. If there's no wind and no shade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you know, come when the sun starts Dang. to drop, the temperature just plummets. It's, you know, it, so yeah. uh, dressing accordingly. It's for not that, easy. It's not, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the layering really yeah, comes yeah. into its own. Yeah, it does during yeah. during that yeah. time of year. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it has to be said too. Just the the beauty of these areas. Oh, it's pretty. With Isn't the it? Autumn colours are just. It, I was I was driving through. Um, where was I the other day when we were out? Uh, it was on the uh, Upper Goulburn, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And the colours, I was just thinking, if I took a photo of this, people would think I'd photoshopped it. Yeah. Because there's all these, even for a colourblind bloke like me, there's still <laughs> oranges and reds and yellows, and it's just you're thinking, how did nature come up with this idea? Yeah. You yeah. know. Beautiful. What was the value? I yeah. mean, other than making us love it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, um, how, you know, how do you, in your so I know you've always got that, uh, I'm looking forward to something, because the season always has so much it to does. offer. It does, it um, does. Uh, but is it a little bit depressing in a way that the rivers are drawing to a close? Do you find that hard? I do. I would find it less hard than I used to, because yeah. I've got so much to look forward to over winter now. Mm. So, you know, I'm really almost starting to bust for an estuary fish, yep. which I haven't done for a few months. Uh, going to do some Sydney um, saltwater in about a month. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, the lake fishing. The lake fishing just keeps going. Yeah. And, you know, on the on the crater lakes and those sort of lakes, you know, it's almost at their best yeah. um, coming into winter. So it's sort of, it's good not to have to make, like at the moment you have to make that hard decision. Like I'm thinking about going fishing next week and I, and I really, really hand on heart don't know whether to go to a river, go to a lake or go to an estuary, yeah. right? So I'm almost going to have to spin a wheel or something <laughs> to make the decision. Sport for Whereas choice. once the river's in, in, in two weeks or so, depending upon what the weather does, you know, the ri- rivers will will become a pretty, t- for me, tenuous option. It's yep. not to say you can't fish right up till the close. Of course you can. But when the trees are bare and it's foggy until sort of 1 o'clock in the afternoon and it's cold, you know, I don't know. It's just like it's a bit meh. Yeah. It's, not, it's not that you can't catch a fish. It's just for me the joy of it has dropped below whatever that threshold is. And um, when you've got... You know the, the the estuary fishing as good as it ever is, yeah. And the the lake fishing in certain cases being as good as it ever is, the rivers lose. You know, yeah. so before the genuine close of the season on the rivers, I'm sort of already I've I've said said my goodbyes and see you in September. Yeah, we yeah. are lucky to have so much good fishing, aren't we? Oh, we are. Yeah, we are. Yeah. 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 Phil, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. Um, thank you for revealing all the secrets around autumn fly fishing. Uh, yeah, look, really appreciate it, mate. Yeah, no, my great pleasure. Yeah, yep. uh, look forward to getting you back on the airways very soon. Very good, mate. Cheers. Thanks, Andrew.